Hello students, welcome back again. Uh, finally, we have come to the last session for this first module. This session is about the operation amplifier application circuits. We have already seen some of the applications in the previous session. Before we go there, let us see what is the outcome of this particular session that we are doing. Upon successful completion of this session, students should be able to analyze operational amplifier circuits and their applications. So far, we have been seeing the applications. We have already done the peak detector in the previous session, plus we have seen a comparator wherein we compared it, compared an unknown signal or an input signal with a zero voltage. That means, one of the terminals was grounded, the other terminal was the input terminal. So, we could always compare the input signal with the zero. So, we call that circuit as a zero crossing detector. Continuing with that, we will see some more comparators this time and then we will move on to filters, oscillators and a very unique application of a non-linear amplifier. This is a circuit for a comparator again, but this time we are not comparing the input voltage with 0. This time we are comparing it with a known reference voltage which is other than 0. It could be a positive reference voltage or it could be a negative reference voltage. Let us go back and see this particular circuit. How exactly is it that we can do this? The first circuit on the left side, this is the one. We are going to compare the input signal here with what we call as the positive reference voltage. Now, this positive reference voltage here VCC. So, is applied at the inverting pin through R2 and R1. So, effectively can you tell what is the voltage we are experiencing at the inverting terminal? Exactly. This is a voltage divided circuit. So, the voltage we see at the inverting pin of this amplifier is R2 divided by R1 plus R2 multiplied by the applied voltage which is plus VCC. Okay. So, we are comparing the input voltage V i with a positive reference voltage given by V c c times R 2 divided by R 1 plus R 2. This is actually a voltage divider network. So, how do you expect the circuit to behave now? Okay. So, if you are going to look at the waveforms here, let us say this is the input, this is a graph that we are trying to plot. Okay. So, this is a graph you are trying to plot this would be your output voltage whenever the input voltage like this is called as with respect to time. Okay. So, let us assume that the input is a sinusoidal voltage. Okay. This is the one. So, whenever the input is larger than the reference voltage. So, this becomes your reference voltage V ref. What is V ref? V ref is nothing but your R 2 divided by R 1 plus R 2 times plus V C C. So, whenever this condition happens, which is happening in this region here. So, in this shaded region that I am trying to show, what exactly is happening? In this entire region, your input voltage is above the reference voltage. So, whenever this happens, the output saturates to plus V sat and whenever it does not happen that is whenever your input is below this line called V ref, then your output becomes minus V sat. So, what am I essentially doing now? I am saying my input voltage whenever it is larger than reference, the output is plus V sat, otherwise it is minus V sat. So, net net then I am saying I am comparing it with a positive reference voltage, not a zero crossing detector, but a V reference crossing detector. Whenever it crosses the reference, I get plus V set, otherwise I will get minus V set. Similarly, moving on the circuit we have on the right hand side, this is the same circuit. The only difference is this time we are comparing with a reference which is a negative voltage. Okay. So, what is the negative voltage now? Everything is the same. In this equation, this simply gets this plus over here this gets replaced by minus V C C. Rest all the equation remains the same. So, where is your minus reference point? Your minus point could be somewhere over here. 
So, now what is the shaded region? The shaded region becomes this entire thing, right. So, whenever your input is larger than this negative voltage, my output is positive, else it is minus V set. Hence, we can connect any other reference at the inverting pin and get what we call as a non inverting comparator with a reference voltage. So, this is a very unique application for comparator other than a zero crossing detector. Now, moving on, let us see the next application for this circuit. This again is a very interesting application. This is something which we call as a window comparator. What did the previous circuits do? They either compared with a positive reference or they compared with a negative reference. Now, suppose I want to have a circuit which can tell me when is my input voltage within a known voltage window. Can I have my output during that time or not? Okay. So, for that this is, a, this, is a, this is a circuit that we are showing. This consists of two comparators now because I have to compare two thresholds. right? So, let me call these two thresholds as one I will call as the lower threshold point okay? and the other one I am going to call as a upper threshold point. If you can see the curve on this side my x axis has V i. right? So, whenever my V i is in the zone lower threshold point to upper threshold point in this particular zone. right? So, whenever it is in this zone I want my output to be 0 volts else my output will be plus V sat. So, if this is a behavior expected let us see how this particular circuit functions. Now, let us see initially the input is less than the lower threshold point let us say I am at this point. Okay? I am at this point at this point what happens? Okay? My input V i is less than the threshold lower threshold point. So, in this here the input at the non inverting pin is larger because V i is less than lower threshold point. So, what will happen is this op amp is going to be plus V sat in the sense this diode would now be forward biased and it can conduct in this fashion. Now, let us see whether the lower op amp comparator also turns on. In this case what is happening? The voltage at the non inverting pin is less than upper threshold point meaning what? It is definitely greater than I mean it is definitely below the upper threshold point. See here I am on this side okay, whereas my upper threshold point is somewhere here. So, my V i is definitely less than upper threshold point. In this case what happens? Since the input at the inverting pin is larger than the input at the non inverting pin, the output becomes minus V sat. The moment it is minus V sat, this diode becomes reverse biased, right? Reverse bias means no current can flow. So, what happens then? The output is plus V sat and it flows through RL and hence establishes V naught as plus V sat. Okay? Now, let us look at the scenario when your V i is greater than the upper threshold point. Okay? So, in that case I will again, again go back here fine. So, let us let us go back and try to redraw. Okay, this is a scenario now wherein I want my V i somewhere over here. Right? So, my V i is greater than the upper threshold point. Let us see what becomes the values of the two comparators. Let us look at the lower comparator first. Okay? In this case, V i is greater than upper threshold point. So, what happens? The input at non inverting pin is larger. So, this output is plus V sat and the diode conducts. If the diode conducts, the current can flow and I can have the output as V sat provided the other comparator is not troubling me. Let us see what happens to the other comparator on the top. In this case, V i is greater than U T P means what? It is definitely larger than L T P. Go back to this waveform here. I am here. So, my V i is definitely greater than the lower threshold point. So, what does that mean? My input at the inverting terminal is greater than the input at the non inverting terminal. So, the output is minus V set. So, this diode is reverse biased. Once it is reverse biased, it cannot conduct. So, therefore, the output is only because of the lower comparator and the D2 being on, and the output is again plus V sat. 
So, in both the cases we have seen whenever the input is below the lower threshold point, the output is plus Vsat, whenever the input is above the upper threshold point, the output is again plus Vsat. Now, let us see what happens when the input is in between these two thresholds. For that, let us go back and try to redraw and see the scenario what happens. So, let us see now, now my input is in this region, I am trying to show a blue region now. Earlier it was low, less than low, uh, LTP or greater than UTP. Now, it is greater than LTP, but less than LTP. That means, it is in this band now, wherein I want to check. Okay. Now, let us see what happens to the upper comparator. In the upper comparator, my VI, it is greater than lower threshold point. So, the input at inverting pin is greater than the input at non-inverting pin. So, therefore, the upper comparator is at minus Vsat and hence diode D 1 does not conduct. Let us see what happens to the lower comparator. My V i is less than upper threshold point means what? The input at V plus V at non-inverting is less or in other words I can say the input at minus pin or inverting pin is greater see here because UTP is greater than V i. What happens? This comparator is also at minus V sat meaning what? Even this diode is not conducting. So, in both the diodes are not conducting, no current flows and then we can safely say V naught is at 0 volts. Okay? So, what does that mean now? Whenever my input is entering in this window, okay, whenever my input is entering in this window between lower threshold point and upper threshold point, my output drops to 0. Thus, I can say that this circuit behaves like a window comparator. Window means what? Whenever my input is within this window of voltage, my output is 0, else it is logic 1 or plus Vsat. So, this is one application where you can use two comparators and achieve what we call as a window comparator. In this case, the output was 0 whenever it was in the window. We can also have, we can rearrange these terms we can rearrange the LTP and UTP, just put them top and bottom and we can get an, get an output waveform which will be something like this. Okay? That means, the output will be 1 or plus we said whenever it is in the window, else it is otherwise. The only difference is you have to simply interchange this lower threshold point and upper threshold point and the circuit behaves in that fashion. Now, let us move on then to the next application for this which is called as active filters. Now, before I can delve into this topic, let us go back to the board and see what exactly do we mean by a filter. Now, we all know op amps can be used for signal conditioning and signal processing. Now, what does that mean? Any, any signal that you take has a certain frequency or it can be a mix of certain frequencies in the sense it can be in a certain range of frequencies. Now, suppose let us say I have a frequency range going from F1 to F2. Okay. If, if this is the graph that I am looking at, okay, this is at 0 frequency which is typically what we call as a DC and let us say this is where I am having F1 and let us say this is where I am having F2. Now, this is typically what I want the gain, right? the gain of my op amp and this is with respect to frequency. What does filtering mean? Filtering means my input signal can have any amount of frequencies, but if I give this particular signal to my op amp, okay, then if my op amp is acting like a filter, then you can design the filter in many ways. Okay. Let us classify these filters. Now, filters can be of generally three types, something called as a low pass filter, which means it passes only the low frequency components. Then we have something called as the high pass filter, meaning what? It can only pass the frequencies which are beyond a certain frequency and we have something called as band pass filters, meaning what? I can pass the frequencies only which fall in certain band. Now, what that means in terms of waveform? Let us assume that this is a gain that I am looking at, a certain gain which is constant. So, let me draw this by dotted line. Now, suppose if I want to have a low pass filter. What does that mean? If the lower cutoff frequency is F1, then 
I should pass all the frequencies below f1, but block all the frequencies beyond f1. What does that mean? If I were to have a gain, it is an ideal filter. Okay. So, it will amplify all the signals which fall in this frequency from 0 to f1, but it will attenuate, see 0, 0 gain. Any signals which come beyond f1, it simply amplifies by gain of 0, means what? It does not pass it. So, this is called as a low pass, I am only passing the low frequency. So, this entire range now becomes a low pass filter. Okay. Now, what if it is a high pass filter? In case of a high pass filter, it is exactly the opposite. What does that mean? It, let us say that particular frequency I am looking at is f2. Okay. That means what? I do not want to pass any frequencies which fall below f2, but after f2 I want to pass everything. So, what does that mean? Up to f2, whatever is the frequency, I do not amplify them at all or amplify by gain of 0. Beyond f2, I pass them all means what? I amplify all those with a gain of a v means this becomes your high pass filter. So, low pass means only low frequencies are passed where higher ones are suppressed. High pass means all the lower frequencies are suppressed, only the higher frequencies are passed. Then what about the band pass? A band pass as the name suggests, it only amplifies the signals which fall in a certain band. Just like you have a window comparator, right? What does that mean? It only passes the frequencies which are in the range f1 to f2 or the band is f2 minus f1. Whereas, any frequency component below f1 or above f2, it simply blocks. So, this is called as a band pass filter. So, this is basically the context through which we have to analyze all the filters that we are going to study now in the future. Now, can these filters be achieved using simple passive components? The answer is yes. We use what we call as RC filters, but the drawback of the passive components is they do not provide any signal gain. They in fact go and attenuate that. Okay? You may not get any gain there, may, there is an attenuation there. So, if you want to have a gain, you need to have an amplifier or try to put an active component into it. Typically, it was done using JFETs earlier or BJTs before that, but nowadays we have such a versatile device like an op amp using which we can have what we call as active filters. Active filters simply mean the same filter techniques using active device like an op amp. So, let us go back and see one of these applications as to how we can use as an active filter. The circuit shown here in the slide is that of an op amp which uses a simple RC network R and a C in achieving what we call as either a low pass filter or a high pass filter. The circuit on the left side is what we call as a low pass filter okay? and the circuit on the, high, on the right side is your high pass filter. Now, we can analyze this in a very simple way, but let us tell what the configuration is. The configuration for both these circuits is what we call as a voltage follower configuration. What does voltage follower mean? There is a unity feedback, right? the entire V naught output is connected back to the inverting pin of your op amp. That means, the gain is unity. Okay? Actually, I am not amplifying here, I am not amplifying, even though I said I will use active filters for amplification. But the thing I am saying here is unity gain, we will come to the filters with gain at a later stage. So, these circuits even though they are active filters, here the gain is unity, but at least there is no attenuation. So, that is the starting point. Okay. Now, how do you analyze this circuit now? Now, this circuit is configured as a voltage follower as I already said, in which you have the input connected at the non-inverting terminal. Okay. This is where your input is going to be connected at the non-inverting terminal that is vi. Okay. Now, this vi let us say initially when the frequency components are very low, let us let us say we took the example 0 to f 1, right? where f 1 is a lower cut off band. So, till it reaches a frequency called as f 1, okay, the signal can easily go into the op amp and it gets passed through the op amp. Why does it not go to through the capacitance? The reason is very simple. What is capacitance offering? The capacitance offers what we call as a capacitive reactance. Now, can anyone tell the equation for the capacitive reactance? Yes? Okay. Here it goes. So, the capacitive reactance is given by x c is equal to 1 upon 2 pi 
f or if you want to use the word c for the capacitance or let it be f okay that means what at lower frequencies okay f is what essentially if it is a dc f would be 0 at lower frequencies the capacitive reactance of it is 1 upon 0 which is infinite or even at lower frequencies beyond 0 it is still much much large that so for all the low frequencies there is no path through c or other words we say capacitor blocks dc or it blocks the low frequency component that being the case all the low frequency components they are allowed to go through the op amp and then reach the output the moment it crosses a certain frequency called as fc which i call as a cutoff frequency okay now what is the value of this cutoff frequency now this cutoff frequency is given by 1 upon 2 pi r into c okay this is the definition for a cutoff frequency fc okay so once you reach this frequency then there after what the capacitive reactance starts becoming smaller and smaller in that case we say the input is now bypassing the op amp and it is going through the capacitor once that happens all the high frequency components get shunted to the ground rather than reaching to the op amp and hence we can say, safely say that we are shutting all the high frequency components while we are allowing the low frequency this is how a low pass filter works in the same way the high pass filter also works what is it that we have to do simply interchange the roles of your r and c okay earlier c was connected as a shunt in a sense as a parallel right this time it is connected as a series that means what the input signals are offered a very high reactance for low frequencies this time why it has to pass through c only then it can reach the op amp as we know capacitor blocks dc so that means what all the low frequency components are blocked once the frequency exceeds the cutoff frequency again given by the same parameter 1 upon 2 pi rc the signal is allowed to pass through the op amp and then appear at the output so this becomes a high pass filter so very very simple configuration very simple techniques how to understand just remember the equation xc is equal to 1 upon 2 pi fc and remember for dc f is 0 so if we can analyze it using this simple equation and whether it is in series or whether it is in parallel accordingly it becomes either a high pass filter if it is in series or as a low pass filter if it is in parallel now this entire circuit that we have studied so far the gain was unity right i mean i am not amplifying suppose if i want to amplify then what is it that i should do right so this is what i should be doing okay we call them as active filters with gain so again this configuration here can someone tell me what is the configuration of this op amp i know in the previous semester or maybe in the first year of your uh, engineering you would have studied the basic configurations of op amp okay which we call as an inverting amplifier and a non inverting amplifier so inverting amplifier means i'm connecting the input to the inverting input non inverting amplifier means i'm connecting the input to the non inverting input but in both the cases the feedback happens at the inverting terminal okay so remember that no matter whether you are inverting or non inverting the feedback whenever it is in a closed loop is always at the inverting terminal so in that context if you look at the configuration here the first configuration on the left that we are looking at is having a feedback resistor r3 and a resistance r2 and i am applying the input vi at the non inverting terminal so this becomes a non inverting amplifier so for the time being if you can simply ignore that this r and c were not there this becomes a configuration of an inverting amplifier wherein the gain is given by the equation do you remember the equation for an inverting amplifier yes the gain is given by 1 plus feedback resistance which is r3 divided by the input resistance which is r1 sorry r2 when i say input this is i am talking about this feedback path at the inverting fan so the gain is then given by 1 plus r3 by r2 and then again whether it's a low pass or a high pass i'm having a capacitor in parallel here means low frequencies are passed high frequencies are bypassed or shunted down so 
The second on the left side is uh, that of a low pass filter with a gain of 1 plus R 3 by R 2. Now, what is a cutoff frequency? Cutoff frequency is again given by the input devices like 1 by 2 pi R 1 and C 1. So, this will not change. Okay. The circuit on the right side is again a similar amplifier this time again with the gain the same gain 1 plus R 3 by R 2, but the difference being I am now having the capacitor in the series to the input apply that means what all the low frequencies are blocked while high frequencies are allowed to go through. So, this essentially becomes a high pass filter with a gain of 1 plus R 3 by R 2. The cutoff frequency again is given by the same expression 1 upon 2 pi R 1 and C 1. So, with this understanding of filters with gain let us now try to look at a numerical or a, or a, or a worked example wherein we can go into much more uh, concepts in detail. So, for that let us go back to this board and see whether we can solve one particular example which highlights all these concepts of cutoff frequency. The circuit that has been uh, taken for this example is that of a non-inverting amplifier and an active filter and we are going to do a high pass filter. Okay. So, this uh, sorry uh, a low pass filter. So, this is a circuit I am going to connect an R here and I am connect a C. So, C in parallel would mean I am automatically looking at a low pass right because low frequencies are passed whereas high frequencies are bypassed. Now, this input I am connecting to the non inverting terminal of the op amp means the plus terminal. Okay whereas the minus terminal I am using it for my feedback path. So, what is the feedback path? I am having two resistors here okay, which are your R 3 and R 2 and this is where you have your V naught. Okay. So, I call this as my resistor R 3, this as your resistor R 2 and these are your C 1 and R 1. Okay. So, this is a very simple configuration of an active filter wherein I am using R and C and R 3 and R 2 for the gain parts. What will be the overall gain then? 1 plus R 3 upon R 2 and the cutoff frequency is given by 1 upon 2 pi R 1 and C 1. So, in this worked example we are giving you the values of R and the C's and ask you some very typical questions. So, let us go ahead and see what the values of these resistors are. This one is given as 10 k ohm or 10 kilo ohm and the capacitor is given as 1000 pico farad right. So, pico would be 10 raised to minus 12. The feedback and the input resistors are respectively 10 k okay, and this one is 100 k over here. Okay. So, the feedback resistor is 100 k and the input resistor is 10 k. Now, the question that has been asked is you have to find out what is the cutoff frequency. Okay. The question that is asked is what is the cutoff frequency. So, let us do the easy part first. The gain part the question I will ask later. First, let us try to find out what is the cutoff frequency. By cutoff frequency, what do you mean? Okay. So, let us say this is the gain equation, uh, gain this thing. This is a gain at low frequencies A v, it is a low pass, right. So, it is having like this, and thereafter it it, 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 it sort of cuts off, right. That is an asymptote, which is at minus 20 decibel per decade or it is minus 6 dB per octave okay. and this happens to be my cutoff frequency F c. Okay. So, the expression for F c is 1 upon 2 pi R 1 and C 1, R 1 and C 1 are given by here. So, it is a simple substitution problem that we start with though we will go into much more uh, other issues later on. So, if we simply substitute the values this R 1 is 10 k and this C 1 is 1000 pico, pico is 10 raise to minus 12. We are going to get the answer as 15.915 kilohertz, right. So, the cutoff frequency for this circuit with these values is 15.915 kilohertz. The interesting question comes now. Now, in this problem they are asking you to find the gain at 4 f c right. 
Okay. So, what they are saying is the first question was find out what is the cutoff frequency and then they are saying find the gain at f is equal to 4 times f c. Right? They are not asking the gain at uh, d c at the low frequency, they are not asking the gain at f c, they are asking the gain at 4 times f c. To solve this initially we have to first find what is the gain at f c. Okay? Since we are using asymptote, we assume that it is not at 3 dB, but it is at 0, I mean AV 0. So, the gain at F c is given by which expression? The simple DC gain. So, what is the DC gain equation? AV 0 is equal to 1 plus feedback resistor R 3 divided by R 2. Okay. So, substituting the values of R 3 as 100 k and the value of R 2 as 10 k, we are going to get this DC gain as 11 it is simply 1 plus 100 upon 10 which is 1 plus 10 and it becomes 11. So, the gain is 11, but typically I would like to express this in terms of decibel. So, if you want to ex express this value in decibel, what should I do? A V 0 in decibel, okay, I have to do 20 log 11, okay, 20 log 11. So, that answer comes to 20.83 decibel. So, the answer is 20.83 decibel. Now, moving on this was the easy part right, wherein uh, we started by uh, finding out what is F c and then we said what is the value of the gain at F c, but the question they are actually asking us is what is the gain at 4 times F c. So, 4 times F c means what? From F c if I double the frequency what do I get? 2 f c right. Now, from 2 f c if I double it again I will get how much 4 f c. So, f 2 f c is 1 octave remember uh, 6 decibels per octave means when the frequency doubles we already seen that in the previous session. So, f 2 f c is 1 octave 2 f c to 4 f c is another octave. So, we now have to find the gain at 2 octaves below f c. Okay. So, for every octave the gain falls by 6 dB. So, for 2 octave what is the fall in gain? Right. For 2 octaves the fall in the gain is 6 into 2 which is 12 dB. When I say fall means I have to subtract. So, if the gain at F c is 20.83 what is going to be the gain at 4 F c? So, the gain at 4 F c is going to be 20.83 right which was again at f c minus 2 times this value which is 12 d b right. So, 20 this much is going to be your answer. So, 20 minus 12 we all it is going to be 8.83 d b. So, this is going to be the answer. Okay. So, this is a very interesting uh, example wherein if you can solve this properly then you know this entire concept you can actually understand what cutoff means, do not just by heart the equations, we can actually know the context and apply your concepts right at f c and at 4 f c, it is going to fall by 2 octaves. So, minus 6 d b per octave, so 12 d b per octave, so net your final answer would be 8.83 decibel. So, this is how you can uh, analyze these op amp circuits with all the parameters that you know. Now, moving on then you can see here the next set of uh, application that we are going to study using filters. These are essentially what we call as a relaxation oscillator. Now, what is an oscillator? An oscillator is something which can generate you the waveforms. Now, the waveforms can be of different types, they can be either of triangular waveforms, they can be either a square waveform. So, the circuit that we are showing here is the one of a square wave generator. Okay. So, this circuit here that we are showing, what does it have? Okay. Again it is having an op amp there, again it is having a feedback path Okay, and it is having the resistors R 1 and R 2. Bear in mind it is not as straightforward, so let us start analyzing it from 0. 
So, initially let us assume that this capacitor is totally discharged. Okay? So, if the capacitor is totally discharged that means what I am at 0 volt at the inverting pin. So, at the non inverting pin I will definitely be greater than 0. Okay? So, that means what the output would now be plus V sat. Okay? So, the output is plus V sat which I am showing here. So, I will be at this point. I am at this point where the output is plus V sat while the input let us say it is 0. I mean the capacitor is totally discharged or the input at the inverting pin is 0. The moment it is plus V sat what happens is now this capacitor starts to charge in this path. Once the capacitor starts charging what happens to the voltage at the inverting pin? The voltage at the inverting pin starts going towards the positive side it starts exponentially rising and the time constant is given by R and C. Now, let us see what is the input that we are seeing at the non-inverting terminal. At the non-inverting terminal, we have an input which is fed back from the output through a voltage divider network. So, if you want to find the voltage at this point, the voltage at this point is R1 divided by R1 plus R2 times plus V sat, yes or no? Because output is at plus V sat and you are applying it through a feedback net through a resistive voltage divider network and the voltage across inverting is nothing but the voltage across R 1. So, voltage across R 1 is R 1 divided by sum of these two R 1 and R 2 multiplied by the applied voltage which happens to be plus V sat. So, let us call this R 1 and R 1 plus R 2 as B. Okay? So, that means, the voltage at the non-inverting terminal is B times plus V sat. Now, as long as this capacitor voltage while charging, it is less than this plus V sat, this condition remains. The moment the capacitor charges and it reaches greater than B times V sat, okay, which we are showing here in this point. The moment the capacitor starts to charge beyond this point, now something happens at this point the input at non-inverting is B times V sat. Now, the input at the inverting pin is going beyond that. The moment it goes beyond that, can the comparator or the op amp not switch the output? Yes, it does and it switches to minus V sat. So, the moment the capacitor voltage increases beyond that, the output falls to minus V sat. The moment it is minus V sat, what happens here? Now, this from plus it becomes minus. So, what happens to the capacitor now? The capacitor which was charging earlier, now it starts to discharge. Right? Remember, 0 volts even the capacitor on the other side is, at, is, is greater than minus V z. So, the capacitor starts to discharge. So, this is the path that it is following. Now, what is the voltage at the non-inverting pin? I am going back and forth, but it is very simple. Now, what is the voltage at the invert non-inverting pin? Earlier it was B times plus V sat, now it will be B times minus V sat. Okay? So, while comparing, while this capacitor is going down, now your new reference is minus B V sat. So, as long as your capacitor voltage is above minus V sat, the output continues to be at minus V sat. The moment the capacitor is discharging below this point, the input at the non-inverting pin is now larger. Even though it is negative, it is still larger. right? See here, this capacitor voltage is going down, but this is a reference. So, the voltage at non-inverting pin becomes larger, means what? The output again switches back to plus V sat. Once the output switches back to V sat, the capacitor again starts charging. So, this continuous cycle of charging and discharging happens thereby we get at the output a voltage waveform which switches between plus V sat to minus V sat. So, this is a circuit of a relaxation oscillator where now the time period is given by a certain expression. We are not going to do the derivation, you can just note down this expression. This time period T here, okay, it is given by the expression 2 R C ln which is as in natural ln, okay, 1 plus b upon 1 minus b, where what is b? b is your voltage divided network, which is R 1 divided by R 1 plus R 2. So, 
For a op amp polarization oscillator, the time period is given by 2 R c times ln 1 plus b divided by 1 minus b. Now, let us try to solve a numerical based on this particular circuit. So, let us go back to this board and try to see a relaxation oscillator and see what the values of the time period are or in other words what is the frequency of this oscillator that we are now going to design. The circuit given is the same. Okay. The only parameters that are given are the parameters for R are given and the parameters for C are given. The value of R is 10 k okay, and the value of C is 0 0.01 microfarad. Okay. The question that they have asked is you need to find out what is the frequency they are not asking what is the time period. You know the equation for time period right. So, the equation for time period was t is equal to 2 r c ln 1 plus b by 1 minus b. Okay. So, r is given c is given can I find out b? What is b of course? b is nothing but your r 1 divided by r 1 plus r 2. Okay. And the values of r 1 and r 2 are also given in the circuit. The value of r 1 is known to be 47 kilo ohm and the value of r 2 is given to be 10 kilo ohm. Okay. So, by simply substituting all these values of r, c and the value of b, we can get the time period t. So, the time period t is then given by if you can just substitute all these values, we are going to get it as 469 microseconds. Okay. What is time period now? This is nothing but this is your output waveform going between plus v sat to minus v sat. It is always fluctuating between plus and minus and this becomes your time period t. Right. So, now that the time period is known, can I calculate what is the frequency? Right. So, frequency is nothing but your reciprocal of the time period. So, f is nothing but 1 upon t. So, if you do the math here, the simple math, we are going to get the answer as 2.13 kilohertz. 2.13 kilohertz. Now, the question that has been asked is to find the frequency plus they have also asked you to find out what is the peak to peak value for the output waveform. So, what is the output waveform? This is the output waveform that I am saying. When I mean peak to peak, it is going from plus V set to minus V set means what? There must be 0 somewhere here, right? So, the 0 is somewhere here. So, this becomes its positive peak and this becomes its negative peak. So, your peak to peak is nothing but the difference between this point and this point. So, what is V peak to peak then? Your V peak to peak is nothing but V sat minus this value, this value minus this value, right? And what is this value now? Minus V sat. So, V sat minus of minus V sat, it becomes V sat plus V sat. So, your peak to peak is nothing but 2 times the saturation voltage of this op amp. The saturation voltage of this op amp is given as 12.5 volts, okay, which is usually less than the supply voltage. Typically, if your supply voltage is plus 15, then your saturation voltage or V plus would be plus 12.5. Okay. So, saturation voltage is given as plus 12.5. So, 2 times that it becomes your 25 volts. So, in this example, what we have seen is we could calculate the time period, hence find the frequency and then draw the waveform, analyze that and find the peak to peak which happens to be 2 times the saturation voltage which is nothing but your 25 volts. So, this would be the numerical that we are looking at which, which sort of enhances the concepts that you have learnt for the relaxation oscillator. So, let us move on then and try to see the last application that we are looking at for this op amp. So, far what we have studied is nothing but a linear amplifier. right? What does linear amplifier mean? Suppose, let us say I have a frequencies in the range 0 to f 1. If I have a gain of a 1 at 0 frequency, then I continue to have the gain of a 1 up to f 1. That means what? 
it will amplify all those signals with uniform gain that is what is called as linearity. Now, essentially all the circuits that we want to use would like would have to be linear right. Like let us say uh, I am speaking now right. So, this is a speech signal or an audio signal it has a certain band. Now, whenever I am amplifying this my voice over here you, you increase the volume knob in your laptop or in your PC or in your audio player. You would like all these frequency ranges to be amplified to the equal amount rather than trying to use what you call as a graphic equalizer. What does a graphic equalizer have? You only go and amplify certain frequencies or you can suppress certain frequencies. But if I want to amplify my entire voice signal, I have to amplify all these with the same gain. But there are some applications very surprisingly you may believe or not, you may require non-linearity in the sense I want to amplify different frequencies with different gains. Wow, so that is a good example to have. So, that circuit is shown here. Now, what, the, what does this circuit do? This circuit is nothing but an inverting amplifier circuit, right? You are going to connect the input to the inverting pin. You are having an RC network. So, typically it is a high pass uh, amplifier that we are looking at. It suppresses the low frequencies, okay? Only the high frequencies are passed. But even in these high frequencies, I would like to amplify only those signals which are small. I will just draw a waveform here. My input it can be either a small input like this with a peak to peak as very less or it can be another signal which is a larger one. Let us say both are of the same frequency. Since it is a high pass filter now the frequency is the same. The red curve also has the same frequency as the blue curve because both have the same time period. But I would only like to push the red curve and I can I would like to suppress the blue curve. This is called as a non-linearity right same fr same frequency two signals, but send one suppress other. How is it possible? It is possible if you look at what are their amplitudes. So, the blue red one has a smaller amplitude whereas, the blue one has a larger amplitude. In this case for the time being let us ignore the diode part of it right. So, let us say if my signal is very small right. If my signal is very small it can neither forward bias D 2 nor can it forward bias D 1. For positive values of V i when I am doing the red signal is small enough to make this on small enough negative values small enough to make D 1 on. So, both D 1 and D 2 are cannot be on in the sense the signal passes through the op amp and I can amplify that. The moment your signal becomes large which is happens the case with a blue waveform here. The moment it is large okay, I will go back and let us redo it once again. The moment the signal is large what happens these two diodes turn on for a positive value D 2 turns on for negative values D 1 turns on. So, for a large signal okay, both the diodes turn on means what I am bypassing the op amp. I am not amplifying through the op amp. Only those signals which are small are getting amplified, but the larger amplitudes are suppressed. So, I can sort of suppress this large signal and only send the small signal. So, this is what is called as a non linear amplifier, which is typically used to suppress the noise, which can be required for calibrating a milli voltmeter, which is shown here. So, so far then in this entire thing, we have seen many applications starting from a simple case of a peak detector to all other amplifiers. So, let us now then rewind and see what is it that we have done in this entire session. We have basically done some more applications of uh, operational amplifier. Now, with that we would come to the close of this entire module session of course, done and the entire module. So, let us quickly go back and look what is it that we have done in this module. In this entire module which spanned about 7 sessions, so you can say we started with FETs, okay, the field effect transistors, we did JFETs, the junction field effect transistors and then we did MOSFETs, the metal oxide semiconductor FETs. We compared between the BJTs and FETs to start with and then we also compared the JFETs with MOSFETs. 
we then went on to see how we can bias these MOSFETs, okay, especially the, the JFETs that we are done, okay, biasing the FETs basically. And then we saw many applications for FETs and then we studied a very interesting circuit called as a CMOS inverter which has both NMOS devices and PMOS devices which is N channel MOS and P channel MOS. That is a very interesting circuit, it had almost 0 power dissipation and very good at suppressing the noise. So, that is the basis of most of the digital circuits that we are using nowadays in VLSI. And then we saw the wave shaping circuits using only ICs. Essentially, we studied so what is called as a stable multivibrator and we studied what is called as a monostable multivibrator. We also saw some numericals for biasing and these multivibrators. In the last leg of this particular module, we studied the op amp, its behavior, its parameters compared with the ideal and practical and then we saw many applications where op amp could be used. So, I hope with this, this will be a good kick start for this entire course. If you have any doubts, you can get back, try to use the reference books which are provided there and try to solve more and more numericals which will enhance your concepts. Believe me, it is only while doing the numericals will you start questioning yourself. If you are trying to answer a theoretical question like what is an op amp or what is an application as a p detector or application as a filter, unless and until you start writing those equations, like unless and until you start asking what is 6 decibel per octave, what is 20 decibel per decade, you will not be enhancing your concepts. So, I urge you to solve more such problems, thereby you can enhance the concepts that you have learnt. So, that is it from my side. Thank you.